And to close today's episode, part four of 12 of Bad Penny by Jacob S. Knapp. In our last episode, we explored more of the early 20th century West Virginia town where our story takes place and the unsolved murder that has touched the lives of nearly everyone there. And now the continuation performed by the author. So, quick catch up. There are three daughters of a Dr. Abraham Smoot, and everyone in town's obsessed with them. Uh, the oldest, Jewel, keeps finding herself smeared in blood by dead bodies, and no one knows why. <laughs> but each time, she somehow isn't guilty. Uh, the middle daughter, who is about five foot tall in boots, her name is Boots, is kind of a femme fatale type, and the youngest daughter is an awkward Delia Dietz type. So, basically, uh, Things have gone badly after the last murder, and the town is kind of a confused place. Part four, that wicked husbandman called love, which lies a bleeding. One family ritual that Dr. Abraham Smoot had continued after his beloved wife Dorothy died during childbirth was her parlor talks. It had been Dorothy's wont to host various women of society in her parlor. The wives and widows and sisters and daughters of the doctors, lawyers, politicians, legislators, educators, and other high-ranking members of the upper crust, and to provide for them both a compelling speaker and enjoyable refreshments. Dr. Smoot himself had organized the monthly events until more recently, when he turned the responsibility over to his daughters. Jewel had been most keen to take charge of curating the monthly gathering, and so had assumed the bulk of responsibility for procuring speakers to talk of subjects of interest, of politics, religion, literature, music, and other pleasant subjects. She also established themes for each talk, which helped to guide the work undertaken by the other Smoot sisters, who arranged for decoration and refreshments. In the three years since they'd assumed hosting duties, the parlor talks had been most enjoyable, far less morose and austere affairs than the ones Dr. Smoot produced, and the numbers of those in attendance had risen dramatically as a result of this fact. And of course, the sisters were keenly aware that it would be foolish not to credit the intrigue surrounding the three murders that haunted Jewel Smoot, as well as the luster of the Smoot House, for also being integral to the boom in polite society types who made the trek to 526 Main Street on the first Friday of each month. However, nobody could have been prepared for the parlor talk Jewel Smoot had arranged for the Friday October 6th, 1911. Jewel had been oddly secretive about the event, leaving her sisters to guess the theme for the evening and to improvise what floral arrangements Cora should create or what sorts of refreshments Boots might prepare that would be most appropriate to the occasion. Cora had worried that the autumnal arrangements of dried amaranthus, caldatus, ferns, and blackberries she'd prepared might come across as a bit too morbid if the topic for the evening was of a darker variety. So many blood red and bruised purple clusters spread throughout the drawing room could leave people feeling morose if the speaker Jewel provided decided to talk of the sorts of morbid topics which obsessed her of late. Topics such as necromancy, tarot cards, phrenology, or God forbid, even Catholicism. <laughs> Over the past year, Cora had cultivated an all-consuming interest in floral arranging and most especially working with dried flowers, a habit which Dr. Smoot admired in the young girl as it represented what he felt to be a manifestation of his own scientific mindset and love of order and organization. He spoiled the towering teen, allowing her to order rare flowers and to take over an entire room in the attic to serve as her drying room, a room where she nailed long swaths of chicken wire onto the oddly angled sloped ceilings in order to naturally hang dry the flowers she used in her arrangements. Her interest bordered on obsession and nearly everybody in the region shared the opinion that it was the sort of rare gift that could contaminate the very soul of the willowy girl who possessed it. It was the type of thing that many felt should be disallowed for the sake of the girl's spiritual health, though Dr. Smoot patently refused to even consider for a moment this line of thinking, refusing to believe his youngest daughter possessed so weak an intellect as to be destroyed by producing what he felt to be fine art. Boots, on the other hand, had a different set of worry regarding that evening's parlor talk. She stifled a smirk as she gazed upon the packed parlor, looking for her sister Jewel, who was oddly nowhere to be seen. Many of the regulars, swinish wives of mine bosses, 
long-lashed daughters of policymakers, tight-lipped sisters of preachers and school teachers, and a slew of widows and spinsters resembling withered deer, all filled the room to bursting with their body heat, their perfumes and powders, and their polite conversations. Boots wondered if they would be able to taste the eclectic oil. This is like an oil with laudanum and opium in it. She'd added to the punch bowl of glue of wine. The word spike tickled beneath her thoughts as she scanned the room for signs that her secret ingredient had taken effect. Cora startled Boots from her spying by placing her cold fingers at the base of Boots' neck and whispering, Don't be alarmed or look all at once, but who is that over there leaning against the pocket door? Boots waited a moment, allowing her eyes to leisurely drift across the room to the entryway where Jewel Smoot stood beside an odd-looking man who wore a filthy overcoat and a faded bowler hat, oddly adorned with a shocking red plume of what appeared to be the tail feathers of a rooster exploding upward from the hat band. Oh my lord, Cora, is that who I think it is? Boots whispered back, the color draining from her cheeks. But before Cora could answer, the clear voice of Jules Smoot quieted the room. I'd like to thank you all for making the trip here on this chilly autumnal eve in early October. I hope that tonight's entertainment will prove provocative and further elucidate many of the rumors that have been circulating about in our fair Appalachia these past few months regarding the rights of individuals in the face of modernization. Hopefully our speaker's words and metaphors will succeed in stimulating our minds and titillating our intellects as we consider the fundamental questions that plague our times and most importantly our current predicament here in the Coal Valley. But I am rambling on, frail woman that I am, caught it all up in a fit of excitement and anticipation for tonight's parlor talk. And so without further ado or commentary from me, I present to you the esteemed Reverend Maynard Miller. There was an awkward smattering of applause. <laughs> try, to, try to do awkward smattering. That was like really <laughs> That's better. As the recognition that it was indeed the infamous evangelical preacher, Reverend Maynard Miller, who stood beside Jewel Smoot, it was the very man who had been preaching against the education of women, the unionization efforts of the coal miner, and the unholy decadence of men such as Dr. Abraham Smoot, in whose very parlor he stood at that very moment, grimly smiling and removing his overcoat, which he handed to Jewel. He doffed his cap and took a deep bow to the assemblage then strode to the place in front of the elaborate bay window at the front of the room, which had been cleared especially for the occasion. He produced a worn and tattered Bible, seemingly from thin air, and thumped it against the meaty palm of his free hand. The room buzzed with hushed excitement. Buzz, buzz. People began to settle themselves in their seats in order to make themselves comfortable for what was certainly to be a heated diatribe. Several women in the back row had already begun to fan themselves, for this was truly bound to be the most exciting parlor talk yet hosted by the Smoots, and the sense that some sort of local history was about to be made, that soon everyone in the region would be buzzing with what had been said, that years from now nearly everyone would burn to have been present when Reverend Maynard Miller first delivered what would soon come to be known as his Coal is the Cornerstone sermon. But before he could begin, and as he filled his powerful lungs to unloose the first impassioned blast of speech, a frail woman in the front row, Pearl Markham, the wife of the local butcher, Wilfred Markham, leaned forward and openly vomited into her punch glass. Bad Penny by Jacob S. Nab. And that concludes today's episode of Claps, a podcast dreadful. Please tune in again next Monday for part five of this 12-part series. Music by Ken Case. For more on the stories and authors you just heard, as well as story recaps, please visit cclapcenter.com slash dreadful. Many thanks to the staff of Quimby's Bookstore for hosting tonight's event and to all of you in our live audience. This compilation, copyright 2012, the Chicago Center for Literature and Photography, released under a Creative Commons license, Sunrise Reserve. I've been your host, Jason Pettis. Good night.